This video is the first of two videos which explore the idea of renewing time or the renewal of time. Human beings have a built-in desire to renew time or if we want to use a biblical term to redeem time. It's a desire for us at certain points to redeem the past and unburden ourselves so that we can walk anew into the future. Throughout history, human beings have actualized this desire through rituals at certain times of the year. We also find this concept lurking in the pages of the Bible. Now this video will use two examples from the Bible to illustrate this concept. First, the biblical holiday Festival of Trumpets. This is commonly known today as Rosh Hashanah. The second one is the Gospel of John. John structures his entire gospel in a way to speak about a renewing of time. A resource, if you want to take your study about the concept of renewing time deeper, is the classic book by Merchia Eliad called The Myth of the Eternal Return. Now once you become aware of this idea, it's not difficult to see it showing up in the biblical text or in the celebrations of ancient Israel itself. In the second video in this series, we'll explore the same idea by looking at a series of symbols which repeat themselves at major turning points of renewal within the biblical story. All of this is based on the symbolism found in Genesis 1 to 3, the creation of the world. So we pray that you enjoy exploring the depths of the biblical text. So today, we are in the midst of what we would call, or our Jewish brothers and sisters call the High Holidays. And this is going to be a review of what we've talked about in the past, but I'll add some new things, and it's always good to review God's words because you'll see things that you didn't see in the past. It's the amazing thing about Scripture is you can constantly go back and review it and always see something different. So I mentioned we're in the High Holidays. Last Monday was the Biblical Feast of Trumpets. We know it today as Rosh Hashanah. It's the Jewish New Year. So we need to explore this biblical holiday and then, God willing, we're going to connect it to Jesus. Now what I want to add to this that we haven't talked about before is the idea of the renewal of time. Because it's a New Year's event, what is it about the renewal of time? We'll add that into our review of the Festival of Trumpets. So the first thing we need to do is start out with a review of the biblical holidays. So we've noted before that in Leviticus chapter 23, God sets out seven biblical holidays. The first one it starts out with is Passover. And we note it's the 14th day of what God calls the first month. So in Exodus 12, which is the story of Passover, it begins with God saying, this is to, going to be for you the first month. So Passover, 14th day of the first month. Next holiday is unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is the very next day, the 15th day of the, of the month. And then the third holiday is first fruits. That shows up the day after the Sabbath. So all three of those holidays happen in the matter in, in the same week. And we noted in the past that Jesus died on Passover as the Passover lamb, God's Passover lamb. He was buried on unleavened bread as the bread of the world, and he was raised on first fruits. The Sunday, the day after the Sabbath. So Jesus is one, two, three for these holidays. Now I want to note today that this holi these holidays all center around a particular harvest. In this case, it's the barley harvest. Barley is the first grain that heads out early in the year, sometime around March to April. The next holiday is the Festival of Weeks. So God says, count seven weeks. Now, seven weeks is 49 days, so the next sentence in Leviticus says, on the 50th day, celebrate this festival. That's the Festival of Weeks, and that is the wheat harvest. So that's the second of the grains to come out. 
but notice it's a harvest festival. And also notice this, that Jesus died on Passover as the lamb. He was buried as the bread of the world, the unleavened bread of the world. And he was raised as the first fruits of the resurrection. But also, 50 days later, what we call Pentecost is the festival of weeks. And 50 days later, the Holy Spirit shows up. So Jesus is four for four with biblical holidays. The next one, and this is what happened the last, last Monday, was the Festival of Trumpets. Then we have Day of Atonement, which is the 10th day, that's Yom Kippur. And then you have the Festival of Tabernacles, which starts on the 15th. But what we want to focus on is the Festival of Trumpets. Now, if Jesus hit Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Holy Spirit on Pentecost, then how is Jesus second coming going to be announced with trumpets. So that day, the festival of trumpets, is when people assume that Jesus is going to be coming back because he's following the biblical holiday, the calendar. Now, this, uh, these last three holidays are also harvest festivals. Grapes and olives and dates, anything that's left over on the tree. But this is a big Thanksgiving type harvest festival. It's a renewal of the year as well, because the rains, God willing, are about to show up sometime in November. So the rains begin the planting season, then you have all of your harvest, and this is like the last harvest of the year. So we can notice that all of these holidays are set around the agricultural harvest. So a couple things about the Festival of Trumpets that we want to look at because this gets a little confusing for Christians. The first thing is is that the words that we use to describe it, Rosh Hashanah, means literally Rosh is head, Ha is the, and Shana is what gets translated year. So it literally means the head of the year. And you'd say, now wait a minute, we just saw that Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, is happening on the first day of the seventh month. How does that translate into the head of the year. Well, again, we're going, this is going back into ancient Judaism to say this idea comes out of the the fact that it's an agricultural year. And it's the renewal of an agricultural new year, not so much like us, we wait till the end of the 12th month going into January. So this month, is their new year. So we see that it's a new year celebration, but again, it's built around the agriculture, not so much around simply the months. And this is, gets very confusing for Christians, but if you study all of the cultures that surround Israel, you'll find the same thing, that their new year celebrations were renewals of agriculture because they so depend on that agriculture for food and life You're constantly trying to renew the time to say, God, bring the rains and redo this whole thing again. So it's a celebration of a renewed agricultural season. Now, there's a second teaching about Rosh Hashanah that is a little bit strange to us. Comes, it dates far back as far as the tradition of this, is that Rosh Hashanah celebrates when God created the world. And you would say, well, how do they know that? Well, they don't. What they're doing is they're going off of the harvest, right? All of the cultures around Israel and Israel themselves would celebrate. It's a ritual to celebrate the renewing of time at their harvest festivals. And so this is the big, the end of the year harvest festival. We're going to go back to the beginning, back to Genesis 1-1, where God's creating the the heavens and the earth, and we're going to do a ritual that celebrates the renewal of time, because that's what we want to happen. So it's all based off of the very first creation of the cosmos. Now, we're going to see in a minute that this is, there's a debate about this, but I just want you to know today, it's traditionally celebrated that it's the creation of the cosmos. But it's a renewal of time. I should mention this. We will find this in the biblical text. So what we're going to do a little bit now in this, in this first part, and then the second part, you'll see it's all in the biblical text, how there's a, a constant renewing of time that's connected to the creation of 
the cosmos when God created the world. So even though that idea sounds a little strange to us, it certainly wasn't strange back when Jesus was alive. So let's go a little bit, let's explore this a little bit, this idea of renewal of time and these holidays. So the first thing that all of the, the New Year celebration is set around agriculture and you, re, you want to renew that agricultural blessing. So if we put time on here, what they noticed was that on this side of time, the past, time got old. The year grew long. The word that they use is profane. Time becomes normal. And they want to live not normal time. They want to live holy time. So there's this seeking. that It's a human longing for the regeneration or the renewal of all things. Because time got old. Now they also said because time got old and profane, it needed to be judged. Time needs judgment. As strange as that sounds, if you think about the fact that the biblical holiday, the holiday in Leviticus 23, that judges the past year's events is right here. It's Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. So this entire New Year month includes the judgment of the past sins so that you can renew time and move forward again. Now I know that doesn't generally fit the way we talk theologically, but This is really important because it it does show up in in our biblical text regarding Jesus. Okay, so you judge the time. You have a a ritual that shows that you're judging that time so that you can move forward into the future, have a renewal of the time going forward. It's a new beginning. Let's think about what we do. What's going to happen on December 31st of this year? Are we going to have, are people going to engage in a ritual that has to do with the renewal of time? The year starts to grow old and people feel tired and we just long for a renewed sense of something, right? Even the most atheist of all atheists Will, are going to go through some kind of ritual in an effort to renew time. It's like it's built into us as a human being. So how have we traditionally described this New Year's event? Well, we say something like this. Father time is growing old. And how do we talk about the new year being ushered in? Baby New Year. And this is just our secular language that we talk about. It's the renewal of time, and that new time is represented by a new birth, a regeneration of time. It's going to be, everything is new, and we feel it. We feel different going forward, right? When somebody gets saved, we call it being born again because there's a renewal of time happening. The past has been judged and our sins are judged and now let's move forward into this new time event. It's a new beginning. It's a rebirth. If you think about this, if we're, if we're just talking about still our New Year's celebration today, let's say we just had this New Year's celebration, right? And you turn on the television the next morning and you're watching Good Morning America or the Today Show or whatever. What, what are they going to be asking their guests? What are they going to be asking? They're going to say, did you make a resolution? Did you make a resolution for the new year? Why? Because we're resolving to live this next period of time different than we lived the last period of time. The time got old and we want a rebirth. And now as we walk into this rebirth, we're going to do it differently than we did the year before. And that's just what we do. Everybody feels that, right? I mean, how many Christians, you know, the beginning of the year, I've, I'm resolving that I'm going to read through the Bible this year, right? And then somewhere around the latter half of Exodus, when God forces you to go through the, the tabernacle description twice, you start to waver because, whoa, man, this is getting to be a lot. It's just our human desire to renew time. Now, let me show you a couple things 
I want to show you a couple things about the word Shana. So the word Shana is what gets translated into English as year. It's the, it's the, the year, it's this period of time. But Shana is a unique word. Shana has two meanings and there, it's what we call an antagonym. So an antagonym is a word with two opposite meanings or two meanings that are opposed to each other. For instance, the word cleave is an antagonym. If a butcher cleaves meat, he's dividing meat. But if a husband and wife cleave, they're coming together. So it's an antagonym. You have two opposed meanings. So Shana is an antagonym. The first one is you're going to repeat. And that's where you get year out of that because you're repeating a period of time. But the other meaning is to change. So you're repeating something, but you're doing it differently. So Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, is a time that you're going to repeat another cycle, but you're vowing to do it differently. The sins of the past have been judged. I'm moving forward a new creation into time, and I resolve to live this time out differently than I did because I don't want the past to get profane again. So you resolve to change and live differently. So it's just kind of cool that that word encapsulates what we do as human beings. Now let me just show you one more piece before we get to the biblical text. But So I, I mentioned this. There's, an, there's a debate about when God created the world. And today the tradition is Rosh Hashanah. But it comes from the, the Jewish writings in the Talmud. And you can see Rabbi Eleazar, or Eleazar says, in the seventh month, that's today, or, that the world was created. That's a harvest festival, so that makes sense. But Rabbi Joshua says, no, 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 in, in Nisan, the first month, now remember Nisan, the first month, that's Passover unleavened bread, first fruits. That's also a harvest festival, that's barley. He says, no, that's when the world was created. So our question is, when was the world created? Can't, I mean, one, we're not going to debate something we can't know, but there's an interesting stuff that shows up in the New Testament about this. Okay, so there's the argument, and here's really what I want to look at. We're going to go to the, to the biblical text, and we're going to look at a renewal of time. So there's a renewing of time happening, and it involves a return to the creation of the cosmos. And the example of this is the Gospel of John. How does the Gospel of John start out? What are the words? In the beginning. John, you can see right there, is he's transporting you back to Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning. And he's doing it simply by opening his book in that phrase. So he starts out with, in the beginning. Now what John's going to do is he's going to structure his entire gospel around seven signs. Now let me ask you, where have you seen something that has seven in it after the words in the beginning? Well, the creation event, of course. You have the seven days of creation after the words in the beginning. So John's going to have seven signs that are showing us a new creation. So let's go through them. The first one, here's how we know he has seven signs. Jesus turns water into wine. And the text says this, What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs. So John's telling us, hey, there's signs here. Then we go to the next miracle. He heals an official son, by the way, in the city of Cana. Same city with the water into wine. And the text says this, This was the second sign that Jesus performed. So John's telling you, here's one sign, Here's the next sign. Here's the next sign. But after this second one, he doesn't number them anymore. But he, you're smart enough. He knows that. You're going to start counting. How many signs does John put in there? Well, let's look. Number three, he heals a lame man. Number four, he feeds 5,000. Number five, he heals a man born blind. Now, number six is the giveaway. What happened, if we go back to Genesis 1, on the sixth day? What did God raise from the dirt? A human being, right? The sixth of the signs that John has, Jesus raises a man, Lazarus, from the dirt. Can you hear John 
speaking loudly? Can we, do we have eyes to see what he's, how he's structuring his text? And then the seventh sign, of course, is the, the cross, the burial, and the resurrection. And so we ask ourselves, if Passover was on a Friday and unleavened bread, when Jesus was buried, was on the Sabbath, did Jesus have the Sabbath day off, just like God did at creation? Yes, Jesus rested on the Sabbath and then is resurrected into a brand new creation. And so John says, early on the first day of the week, like he's emphasizing, it's a new week, it's a new beginning moving forward. That is cool. John is telling us there's a new beginning. There's a new period of time. There's a renewal of time in Jesus in everything that he did in his death, his, his burial, and his resurrection, there's renewal of time, regeneration. Let me just give you a uh, reference for this before we move on to the second part. N.T. Wright, he speaks a lot about this idea, the John structuring his gospel around the seven signs, and just like at creation. In this book called Following Jesus, you'll find a chapter on John where N.T. Wright talks exactly about what, what we're talking about today, is a renewal of sorts of time and how John structures his gospel around the Genesis 1 narration to show us that something is happening to the creation in Jesus. We'd like to give a special thank you to all those who contribute financially to Fig Tree Ministries. It's your generous support that makes these videos possible. So for you, a special Hazak Hazak Vanit Hazak. Be strong, be strong, and together we'll be strengthened. If you've been impacted by this teaching, make sure you like it on YouTube. And make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel to keep up with our latest videos. To impact those in your community, share this video on Facebook. For more biblical teachings which explore the depth of the biblical text, go to our website, figtreeteaching.com.